Okay, I think everyone is back from the workshops. Um, thank you so much for sticking with us until this, which is the, the last session and the last panel of today, and also the end of uh, the first two days of the workshop. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be chairing a panel on uh, sustainable software practice. So we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, what different people are doing to try and improve software sustainability practice and software practice in general uh, and uh, try and get a little bit of information from people in the room about how they do this and what things work, what things don't, what we need to change, what uh, needs to stay the same. Uh, I have an amazing set of panelists to my left. Uh, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves, which means that I won't pronounce anyone's names wrong, uh, and then we're going to go through a few questions, uh, we'll be going out to you in the audience as well, so start thinking about uh, your own questions for the panel and for the rest of the room, uh, and we're going to try and do this all with one little microphone, so we'll see how this works, but um, what I'll do first is get my panellists to introduce themselves. Um, hi, I'm Becky Arnold. I'm a PhD student in astrophysics at the University of Sheffield and I was one of last year's Software Sustainability Institute Fellows. And with the money I used the I uh, used it to bring speakers to Sheffield to talk about different aspects of good practice for software and essentially this difference between some academics not even all are taught to code, but nobody's really taught how to code well and just giving people the opportunity to learn about these topics. Um, since then, I've been working with Kirsty on the Turing Way uh, handbook, uh, writing chapters on good practice for reproducible science, which was a really, really interesting topic to be involved with. And I'm now back to doing my, astro my astrophysics PhD. And we'll hopefully wrap that up by September. Uh, my name is Dana Boquin. I'm the head librarian at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And a lot of the things that concern me and why I'm here uh, kind of circle around the idea that the community of people who I'm responsible for providing resources to support their work and capturing the things that they make so that they can be used by others and to kind of like represent what, what they're doing uh, it is code. And uh, it's code and all sorts of other things. Uh, lots of complicated digital objects. And uh, for the first time kind of in my profession anyway, we're hitting a point with these kinds of objects where we're not actually the ones taking care of them. And so you're depositing and archiving your, your software elsewhere. And you've been operating a landscape where it used to be that we would catalog everything for you. And so I'm really interested in uh, metadata standards that make it so wherever you're putting your stuff, you don't have to become a cataloger, and that I'll be able to find it and we ensure that it's useful in the future and that we're providing you resources so that you actually can do this critically and to know you're making choices when you are. Thank you. Um, I'm Melody Beals. I am a lecturer in digital history here at Loughborough. Um, I was trained as a cultural historian and then kind of snuck over into social and economic history, which meant I liked numbers more than uh, cultural ideas, but I liked both. And um, my main role in all of this, I guess, was that I was an autodidactic programmer. I realized I was doing some things over and over again, and I'd teach myself a tiny bit of code so I could stop doing that and driving myself insane. And through that, I found the Programming Historian, which was a group of other autodidactic historians who were kind of learning Python kind of on the weekends without telling their boss. And they encouraged me to apply for a fellowship with the um, Software Sustainability Institute, which I'm very glad I did. And since I've been doing that, um, I've done a lot more work with Programming Historian, creating tutorials, creating example guides for how historians can recognize that they do use data, even if they don't want to believe that, mm -hmm. and how to program it and how to make results from that. And with my fellowship money and with some other support from my university, I've been able to hold sort of ad hoc programming and data science courses for historians and other social scientists. 
and it's been an experience, very collegial, everyone kind of believing that everyone else in the room knows better than they do, um, but it's been a lot of fun to sort of collectively, autodidactically learn how to program. Um, my name is Chris Menzel. I'm a program director at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which is a, um, a private philanthropy in the United States that funds, amongst other things, basic research in the natural sciences. Um, the program that I lead is called Data Driven Discovery, which is about um, data intensive science in the, in the natural science um, arena. And we fund, uh, amongst other things, research software. And all the big difference between the kinds of funding that we provide and say government funding is that we tend to fund once, um, maybe one and a half times a project. And so we're seen as more of a kind of seed or catalytic funder rather than a sustained funder. And yet, and still, we worry about the long-term sustainability of research software. And so we're trying to think about different ways to um, play in that space responsibly, and yeah. Cool, thank you very much for the introduction. So the first question uh, I set to the panel um, is one that I did mostly just because I thought it sounded quite good from a kind of like sentence structure. Uh, so I asked them, does practice make perfect? Um, and I guess I'm, I'm asking the panel uh, for your thoughts on whether doing things again and again kind of uh, instilling practice by both senses of the word, uh, does that actually help um, to make software usage, software development, all of these sort of practices uh, better? So, who wants to start off? Um, I would say practice doesn't make perfect simply because there's lots of great ideas and great innovations in good practice for coding, which we couldn't think of alone simply because we aren't, you know, all knowing. We can't come up with every idea under the sun independently. We've got to look outwards to look at all these interesting, like blog posts and resources and things and uh, thoughts and tools that other people develop as well. I'd say practice inevitably makes improvement, and I think it definitely helps, but not on its own. And also. There is no perfect, because if anybody here can put their hand up and say, I have written a bit of code that's perfect, and it's more than 10 lines long, then I, I, I don't think that we can agree on that. So I guess like, my first reaction to that is kind of, I guess, what are you practicing? Uh, I think the context matters a lot. I think if you're trying to think about skills development, something that has a concrete answer to what the right thing to do is, uh, then you can get this iterative improvement because you have something to correct and you have something to kind of gauge it against. But when it comes to a lot of the work that I do or the things that I'm concerned about around preservation or around uh, how we give uh, proper attribution and kind of be able to track the provenance of things like software, all of this is uh, normative behavior. So the entire scholarly communication landscape and all of cultural heritage preservation is based on what everyone in the hive mind thinks is important. And it's a reflection of that. So we can't prioritize things to save them and to reformat them and to do all kinds of interesting things with them and to get people to practice things that will enable us to do that unless we kind of agree on what those things should be. So when it comes to setting expectations or like who gets cited and when? Um, what is the thing that you should archive? How do you have a conversation about who is not going to get credit? Um, if the thing that is your normative practice and to give credit is to not directly point at the code itself, but to point at things like papers, if, if, you, if you're doing the practice again and again and again, all you're doing sometimes is reinforcing behaviors that kind of self-select in a lot of ways for the kind of landscape you're operating in where you see these problems. And so if in the future what you want is like much more equitable kinds of ways of thinking about different ways people contribute to the scientific enterprise, you have to change the thing that you're practicing and then you have to do it enough so that no one is thinking about it anymore. Um, so I think depending on what it is you're trying to do, 
a lot of practice might help, but please think critically about what you're practicing. I think I'm going to do a variation of that. And I, I really agree. I think for the social sciences and specifically for the humanities, the idea of programming and good, clean data science was really difficult because it wasn't something we did all the time. It wasn't something we even did on like an annual or, or biannual basis. It was something that you'd go to a conference and there'd be a session on it and you'd go and you'd go, wow, that's neat. I will never think about this again. But it was a great presentation. And that became kind of the norm. And there was a couple of us that were weird and decided to seek out tutorials and kind of mash things together and figure things out very badly. But what I found is that through sheer annoying force of bringing it to people's attention over and over again, you can practice that kind of cultural change. So an idea that was brought up last collaboration workshop, I think by James Baker, um, was an idea that having a single workshop or a single session wasn't the most effective way of having his library carpentry program. And that actually doing a weekly session was more useful because people could get a little taste of it, go away, think about it, and come back. So at Loughborough, I had a weekly Python class. We didn't get very far in any particular week, but everyone would come together every week for 50 minutes or so move along a little bit further in the Jupyter Notebook and act very collegiately and, and it kind of reinforce that idea that yes, for half an hour a week, I will actually try and do this. And I don't know if anyone's like research programs have changed because of it, but at least they all feel now that it's something that is part of their lives and they can understand it and it's not a one-off. They can just figure out and, and let go. Yeah, not too much to add. I, I, I kind of love and hate the, the phrase. Um, on the one hand, the practice is such a great um, way to just point out that you're never done, and that you just need to continually refresh and refine, and, and there's so much about software that requires that kind of consistent, ongoing work that's re required. But practice, um, especially if you use it kind of musically also, seems to mean that you're kind of going for a goal or like a level. Yeah. And the problem is, is that those goals keep moving, as others have pointed out. That the goalpost for what it means to be sustainable research software in 2008 when I started in this arena to now is just completely unrecognizable. So what would have been totally sufficient in 2008 um, now is just the beginning. We're, we're talking about unit testing and continuous integration. These were things I even like on the roadmap for research software a decade ago. Yeah. So I think uh, all of your answers kind of point to this, both this thing of there's um, there are some things for which there's an iteration, and because you have an idea of the goal that you are trying to get to, you can see whether you're improving towards that goal. And then there are other things where repeating something will not actually help either because the goalposts have moved or you don't know where the goalposts are to start with. Um, so uh, what do other people think about this? So uh, does this practice help? Yeah. Um, practice is certainly very important and I would contend perfection is one impossible but two actually undesirable. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit controversially because if you've got practices that are so restrictive that it restricts for innovation that things never go wrong, you can't try new stuff. What you're actually doing is you're locking down what you can actually do, be it data science or software, but whatever it is. So it's, it's okay to let stuff go wrong. Um, it means you're testing the boundaries and it gives you the elbow room for you to be more creative in what you're trying to achieve. Has anyone got any examples of where uh, practice went wrong, but ultimately that was a benefit? Like, because this is something that we, we're often told, yeah. Well, I can give you an example of non code yeah, but I think it's a specific thing, you know. Uh, I, I have been practicing doing backstroke swimming. Turns out I've been practicing it completely wrong because I don't know how to do backstroke. So I'm now very good at doing something on my back and swimming. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we need to be careful with the practice. If, you're, if you don't, you know, going to sort of Donald Rumsfeld, if you don't know what you're doing wrong, you don't know what you're doing, it's, practicing isn't helping. 
And taking that analogy too far, I guess, because um, I like doing that, uh, that, that's fine if your goal was to get from one end of a pool to another in water, but not if you were training to be part of the swimming team for your local, um, your local county. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. I just want to throw out an idea that I'm, I'm surprised hasn't been brought up, and if folks want to expand, but I mean, the whole idea of scientific software is that it is a system for taking standardized process and moving it out of here. So, I mean, to some extent, I feel like to the extent we want to like practice something and make it automated, we actually just we may as well just get it out of here, right, out of, out of the head of so, people. So here, I'll go back to the panel. Do we believe that that the you know all research practice is something standardised that needs to kind of come out of here and be able to be uh, placed down in a way that others can can use and take it? Or does that does that change between disciplines? I, I can't speak for a whole lot of disciplines, but I know for history, so much of it is socialised. It's you know you look at a particular source and you think about it in a historical way and you have these sort of general rules in your head and a lot of it is interpretive and that's very dangerous because if you don't clearly write it out in your narrative the idea of how you got from that data to that conclusion is completely lost so i really liked that aspect of programming where i have about 17 rules to decide which newspaper I actually copied for the other one i could kind of just tell you by looking at it but when i had to explain it to a computer it documented it step by step so now if I were to you know, die next week, someone would be able to know, okay, this is how Melody figures out which newspaper copied from which newspaper, in a way that would have been very difficult for me to explain narratively. And it also keeps me honest. I don't start bending the rules just to make my article flow a little bit more nicely. Okay, I'll move on a little bit. So, so one of the challenges that we often have in this area is that uh, we have some wonderful initiatives that start up uh, and they get a lot of interest, but ultimately they're just dependent on the goodwill and, uh, and working hard of, of one or two people. So how do we ensure that um, these initiatives aren't just dependent on a few people? So one example is something like the Carpentries, where we've seen um, them grow from being dependent on one person to going towards a system where there is kind of support for all, it's almost a pyramid scheme, always kind of like drawing new people in um, and expanding it that way. But so, so what other ways do we see of making sure that practice isn't dependent on just one or two people? I'd say the democratization of a lot of processes is really, really important for that, like GitHub speeches, which allows anybody to submit issues, to submit pull requests, is really really important for allowing other people not only to be involved but to feel that they're allowed to be involved whereas if it's just one person's project it's hard to know that it's there or to meaningfully contribute i think democratizing not only the ability to uh, contribute but the ability to make decisions is really really valuable for that um, there's a couple of things. Um, but yeah also things like having a code of conduct and welcoming people and all the rest of that is also very, very important for building a community. So being, being sure to be welcoming to newcomers is a huge part of making a project sustainable. I don't disagree with any of that, but I do think that when we start talking about sort of ways to like spread the work around or make sure that we're not getting the same people being the volunteers and like the carriers of the thing, it's easy to say we should democratize something, or but I think that one of the things that often is hard to do is acknowledging the care work that people are doing, and to tweeze that out, and to not just say, oh, well, they're just doing that out of the kindness of the heart. Like, think about why and who they are. I think a lot of this sometimes, I mean, honestly goes to gender in some cases. These things can have inherent biases baked within them. Like, are the people who are doing this, the people who have, uh, they don't have many other options, have they built their career into this thing? Um, I think really looking closely at who is doing the work and what the work is and acknowledging that overtly and explicitly 
through things like contributor documents, codes of conduct, but to like remember there are people behind there and that you can talk to them sometimes. And I think that we need to do a better job as a community of people who are interested in sustainers and who they are and what motivates them. We need to look at that really closely because if you want to spread around whatever they're doing and why they do it, you need to understand what's motivating them. And sometimes that it could be because they're just doing it and they care a lot and they want to put the time in. But that's not always the case. So if I could just do one person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I have to think there's been some really interesting work on software citation. I think that was actually one of last year's Hack Week, uh, sorry, Hack Day projects, which is trying to develop more standard standardized tools for that. I think that if we can get to a point where software citation becomes much more mainstream and much more recognized as currency, both by you know institutions and funders, I think that would be a big step forward in making sure people get the credit, which also makes a greater incentive, which makes it more su sustainable. Thanks. Um, of course, we're talking about um, a lot of different types of software. Um, the software that's written by a postdoc, you know, doing her work in someone else's lab, um, software that's already beyond the best factor of one that has multiple people working on it, but everyone is a user, there's no users outside that. And actually, URSI, um, as Dan's mentioned before, has a um, kind of category list of software stages. And I'm sure there's others, but you know this notion that, you know, to answer this question, you kind of have to answer it for every level. So how do you get, um, I think the most kind of critical bit is to get beyond just a solo developer. You know, how, what, what does it take to get a project kind of beyond, you know, beyond the best factor of one? And I think for that, um, it has a lot to do with the culture in which that software is built. Yeah. So let's take the example of a, of a postdoc in someone else's lab, the lab head then has a lot to do with what the norms are of you know the work that's being done, including building the software. And if the lab head doesn't understand, doesn't treat software the way that they might treat other research activities, in other words, doesn't ask to see the code as it's being written, um, the way that they might want to look at data as it was being gathered or you know, chat about the process and the methods that they are using. Um, I think that's where things start going awry. And this we hear over and over again that a postdoc leaves with code that is now not usable by anyone else. Well, that's not the postdoc's fault. Yep. That's the lab head's fault. And so um, the bigger challenge is how do you change the practice of people who are doing quite well thank you. And I would really love some answers to that. Yeah, does anyone have yeah? Um I think what we're sort of converging is starting to make code review part of something labs do. Mm -hmm. Um talking about uh, practice making perfect personally I think more eyes on your code is what's gonna get it closer to perfect <coughs> or better or yeah. so um, yeah, trying to uh, include code reviews as part of something labs do, not just a journal club. Yeah. Um, it also would address things like reproducibility. It's amazing how many times I think, yeah, I've totally documented all dependencies are, are there. And I go to my collaborator and say, look what I've built for you. Just, you can just you know, clone it and install it and run it and straight away egg on my face. Yeah. You know, until that one more person runs your code, you just have no idea what the quality of it. So yeah, more yeah. eyes on the code. Uh, I was just going to say that I think one thing about the culture and the democratization and, and extra eyes as well is, is this idea that we have to remember that culture and all of this is based on human connections and the idea, I like the idea of the, the sort of friendly pyramid scheme, the idea that, you know, I'm here because James Baker invited me and he was here because <laughs> people invited him and it, the more people you can kind of bring into your circle that are you know a little bit interested in it and maybe getting out of it, they bring more people in and it doesn't have to be 100% committed all the time, but 
if you're kind to other people, it encourages them to be kind, not just back to you, but to a wider circle as well. And it can be really hard sometimes to say, like, they're not doing it right, they're being horrible. But if you're kind and you develop a society of sort of kind people around you, you're going to be more successful and it's going to work out better in the long run rather than trying to necessarily broadly people of that practice, just let them fail and succeed through kindness. Yeah, I'll come to you in a little bit. I, I think that's something that I've experienced myself. I work a lot with volunteer organizations um, and one of the things that I've noticed there is that it is about this kind of, uh, it's the kindness, but it's also about trust. Um, so, the best way of growing out a volunteer organization is around giving people responsibility and trusting them, them to do things, even though you know that they will fail many times in doing that, but drawing them in because of that, and then they draw on their friends, and then the supportive environment continues, and you can then take a step back and say, all right, this is big enough for, for uh, people to do on your own. Yeah, I, I think I'm just going to talk around that with an example now. Brilliant. So combining those two things, I think, is really powerful. Once you have a framework in which you operate, where you have, say, uh, issues on Git and all that, now you know who is involved, and you can spot the people who are your tangential users, who are probably sat there thinking, this isn't my thing, I'm intruding on a private club here. If you reach out to those people, you're only going to get love back, right? Please help me review this thing. Hey random user, I don't even know who you are. Please come and look at this review. Right. Oh, I think, okay. Yeah. Do you want to say something quickly and then we'll go? Yeah. I would say essentially when you've got these communities where you're trying to invite people in, I think the one thing that can be a little dangerous though is not uh, doing that in such a way that you're giving agency by default. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so often I see people, or there's like a, you know, that this is open. And then you look at like all the rules that you might have to be able to get around or what you need to do to be able to actively contribute to something. This happens with library software actually a lot when it comes to being able to manage digital collections. Like, oh, this is totally open. You can start your own server and use this and that and the other thing. But the threshold that's set for contributing is very high. And so you haven't actually given people the tools that they need to actively engage, but you've just given them exposure to something, and so. You haven't given them different steps up to yeah. becoming um, a full collaborator. Yeah, just saying like, here, you're welcome, is not usually enough yeah. to kind of get people who aren't already capable of contributing, contributing. Yeah, that's the open source licensing fallacy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit from another but I just uh, spent some time this year on the industry days in the European Union and everything was about digitization and digitalization in industry. And there were some interesting uh, talks about that uh, the European uh, digital awareness <coughs> and knowledge is very low, so we need to do a lot of education. And what usually happens is that these people go to school, so you start the education early, and in Britain, sometimes you find the Python club for a nine-year-old. So the question to the panel, do we think this cultural change where we get digital awareness in young people, so when they come to industry, is a game changer. So we don't have to worry about because they come ready. We just have raw diamonds we have to, to, uh, to cut <laughs> into in, shape. Is this what happens? Do you think that will help the digitalization opens up? Sure. So does, basically, yeah, does, does, teaching, does teaching programming at that level, does that help us? I have, I'm holding a mic, so I, I got to have a mic. Um, I think that it helps, but by the time they're in industry, if you start them at nine, none of the things they learn will be cool anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I think that it's more trying to teach like the critical thinking and the problem solving skills and the technology more broadly than it is um, like the, the actual coding or whatever. Yeah. And I think that that's only helpful, again, where you have those places where you have those resources to get those people started. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that can be kind of like a self-perpetuating system where you're not necessarily, if you rely on that happening at those places, yeah. uh, you're going to be actively excluding a lot of places that can't participate in that. So that's not like a solution. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, you know, educate, like the next generation absolutely changes things, right? There's no way around it. Um, 
but if we stick to kind of uh, research software for a moment mm -hmm. and the research environment, it's a very heavily um, inherited system. And the winners tend to be those that emulate the current winners. Yeah. And so what the, the culture propagates, and I forget who I was talking to, some, someone recently about, you know, everyone has academic parents, and they inherit traits from their parents, mm -hmm. and and that's that language is used informally all the, all the time, but it's the most accurate um, description of how academic culture is passed from one generation to the next. Yeah. And so, um, so what I guess I'm trying to say is that the culture is, is stickier and has greater momentum than any kind of individual nine-year-old you know, nine who learns how to code. So and if we take the example I mentioned before, you know, eventually she becomes a postdoc in someone's lab, yeah. writes some code, and then leaves. Yeah. And then that, I don't know what change that made. The code might be written beautifully, yeah. but no one can, if the PI still, the, the lab head, you know, doesn't appreciate that, Code and doesn't can't leverage it, then it doesn't. It just kind of dies after that. Uh, yeah, paper but the luck has been hopefully has been retired at some point. No, no, no. The, the, the wisdom that you know academia advances one death at a time is yeah. you know I hear that a lot. Uh, you know, I, I I'm just wondering you know how many people have died in the 11 years that I've been at this, and yet I still don't see like the dramatic change that I would have expected yeah. coming from the outside. So taking that academic parenting <coughs> idea, and I, I, I do agree that seems to be one thing that anecdotally is, is the way that good and bad practice gets passed down the chain. Um, so, what, so what's the equivalent then to, to some of the other things we see uh, when we're trying to instill different, different kind of learning into, into children? So, so what's the equivalent of, of your aunties and uncles helping to raise you? What's the equivalent of, of being adopted and uh, learning different things? Or maybe a better way of putting that might be, what's the equivalent of your teacher at a school who's meant to provide the uh, other experience that might contrast with what you're learning at home? Yeah. What, who, who are the teachers in this scenario in academic parenting? What's the kind of practice you wish people would just get already? And, and there's one. So um, 
yeah, what, what, what would you just like people to just, just <coughs> understand and, and do? I think, sort of counterintuitively, the thing people should understand is it's okay to reinvent the wheel if you're trying to learn how something works. So you don't necessarily have to spend all day going for finding the magic library that will do exactly what you want. You can piece it together with a thousand if-thens if it helps you understand how the process is working and you're trying to learn how to, to program the first part. You don't have to use everything prepackaged. You can learn from basic steps. I want, I want to make sure to go right after you because um, <laughs> I was going to say something that doesn't necessarily contradict, but it could if you take it out of context. So I think the clause there that's really important is if you're trying to learn. Oh, yes. If and so, so once you've learned and you're starting to build new things that you think might be useful for the community, please check first yep. that someone else hasn't built 80% of what you're trying to build. Because I think um, growing existing projects is actually going to be the strength of this community rather than starting your own bespoke projects just because it doesn't do 10% more than what something already out there does. I feel like I have a lot of things I want to say right now. But I think <laughs> if I were, yeah, I think if I were to summarize it down to like one thing, is that we're still defining what these things are and that you have the capacity to make those definitions. So those behaviors that you want to incentivize, <laughs> all of that, like all of that is subject to change right now. And these things are malleable, and no one's going to do it for you. And because we don't have those norms yet, and those practices for you to follow, this un this has to be part of your work and part of something that you think about. And it's got to be something that you spend time on and that you put the work into. I guess like we're gonna build tools for you, and there's gonna be like great resources that you can follow, and all of them are gonna be wrong in some way. <laughs> And the only way to make them better will be to actively engage in dialogue with your communities. The only way to make them better is to express what the actual needs are, because the people who are producing the tools and the resources and like operating a level above you that you think you're subject to, you can play with them <laughs> to talk. Thank you. Um, I guess mine's not so much from quite the software sustainability angle, but from research sustainability angle, and if I could get people to understand one thing, just click my fingers, it, to use version control, because it just solves <laughs> so many problems. <laughs> uh, sorry, I keep on. Um, that would be the one thing I, I, I would sort of wave my magic uh, wand uh, over. Um, in terms of software sustainability, it, in a very similar vein, getting people to put stuff on GitHub and getting people to include licenses so that people can actually make use of stuff as well as just looking at it in a, a way and build upon it if they can. Um, it, when I was doing the uh, Turing Wave project with Kirsty, it was like collating a lot of resources which already existed because there's loads of really good material about, mm -hmm. out there about software sustainability. But so much of it doesn't have a license, so it's kind of tucked away on some of these blogs which who knows how much traffic that gets. Also, irritatingly, a surprisingly high fraction of materials about open science, and, like, <laughs> which usually have like included license in their like first paragraph, don't have licenses on them. Yeah. Um, so maybe as, a, as like a, 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 like a, a sub-bullet point to that, following your own advice where it's possible. Uh, let's go to the audience for things they'd like to see. Yeah. yeah. Coming back to the stick and also to the lab pad, there's a review that we have in place in science. And one of the people at TU Delft, who's also a data champion, recently published a blog post where he sets out this default reply where he says, like, I see code is a significant part of your article, and if you want me to review your paper, I will have to see the code. And the thing is, then the stick then lands back to the corresponding author which is quite often the lab hat. And I think if you want to do this in a more fundamental way, going back to the developer or the grad student or someone who writes code, that's not really what you want to change because usually they're more than willing to do so but don't get the, the accreditation when they do. So perhaps really taking sure that when we review a paper, we take this extra step and ask for the code so that editors uh, are more aware and that lab hats become more aware. 
And that it's something that really affects them if they don't have their things in place, whether that's version control or, or anything else in this whole pipeline. That reminds me of, uh, of something that I did with some others who may or may not be in the room uh, uh, around peer review and kind of uh, a sort of almost a manifesto, an oath that says, as a peer reviewer, ideally I'm aiming to get to the point where I'm a co-author on your work. I, it's, it's like it's not me versus you. The thing I'd like to change is that for reviewers to be uh, on the side of the author, not on the side of the journal. So, um, any others before we start wrapping up? Yeah. sounds like we're going to have to have a session on next next year is how to make your your uh, la department or research group head uh, a better manager <laughs> that sounds like something that we could do, work on okay take so comment there and then we'll go yeah, to the last question the last comment you think there's for example the RDA this is the research data lines uh, so that's the worldwide organization do you think as individuals we have to go uh, to become a subgroup of something bigger. I think the software sustainability institute is doing a good job. We recommend it to everybody on the planet we find and say, look at them, they do a good job. But do you think we have to become a lobby and have to become bigger? Well, that's an interesting question because a number of us in this room are starting an organization called the Research Software Alliance. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to really put a point on the need for not so much as a lobby organization, but as kind of an organization of yeah. organizations that care a lot about yeah. these but kinds of topics. Up there, because I think that's, that's one way to go. Lobby can be negative. I mean, in the in positive. In the path of it, yeah. But what yeah. you just said, that hits the spot of being because you can become a member, and your professor can take you what you want, but you find some people that think you like, and you can share, and this is a place you can go. I think that's what you should be doing. It's, it's very early stages now, but Stay tuned, watch the space. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, we're nearly at time. Uh, I'm just going to ask you all a final question, 30 seconds to answer each. Uh, so uh, what piece of advice would you give to someone starting up a new initiative? <laughs> I would say um, before you actually get started, uh, have the difficult conversation about who will do what and to what ends um, and to make that as explicit as possible because if you wait till the end to try to figure out who's managing what and uh, who's going to get credit for what and who's responsible for what, you're kind of setting yourself up for something that's fundamentally unsustainable and you're going to wind up giving people work 
that uh, they never signed up for or that you don't have like the right manpower for. So kind of getting like a comprehensive accounting of everything before you get going and to be explicit about it. I would say in sort of Kickstarter fashion that you should try to have iterative goals, to have a very small goal, but plan for your expansive goals as you go along so that you don't ever feel like you go off in a, a single direction and, and leave things behind, that you're always being rounded and moving outwards in your goals and your reach, as opposed to getting overexcited and going off in one direction and losing sight of what you originally intended to do. Kind of a generic question, but I'll, I'll give it a nice generic answer. Um, be be kind to your future self. So so be put in that extra effort now, not to help others, but just to help yourself later on down the line. Comment your code not so that someone else can read it, but so that you understand what the heck you're trying to do there. For instance, uh, it's sorry, quite similar to your answer. It's just to have some kind of plan, uh, just so that you've got <laughs> some <laughs> things that you want to aim for, but maybe not reaching for the stars, but like an idea of a direction you want to go and how you're going to get there and what you're going to need to get there, because otherwise you might end up just sort of going in circles a bit. And even then, even if it doesn't work, doing one small cool thing is still an achievement, and to, to be okay with that. I think for me, the big thing is uh, to get a great set of people together who've got a diversity of experience um, and are willing to share their, their knowledge uh, with others. So um, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for being an absolutely wonderful panel and thank you audience for your questions and your comments and uh, let's give them a round of applause.